This is the window outside my office. I love coming in early in the morning when the sun is shining through those beautiful stained glass windows in the old main. Students like it too. I occasionally will surprise a student who's woken up early just to be able to do their studying in this beautiful place. I'm going to tell you about the history program here in a moment, but something that I like talking more about than the program is about our students. So I'll just open with the story about uh, one of our students to give you a kind of flavor for what it might be like to be a history student studying the past at Augustana. Have you guys uh, heard of Weyerhaeuser Lumber? It's the largest lumber company in the United States. Today it's headquartered up in the Northwest in Seattle, but Weyerhaeuser actually got its start right here in the upper Midwest. And we have a old beautiful house on campus that is connected to the Weyerhaeuser empire through um, one of the co-founders of the company, a man named uh, Dankman. So when he built what we call House on the Hill now, he filled it with beautiful woods. And you're looking at uh, the dining room at House on the Hill. Now students can stay at House on the Hill. There's a special program where you apply and they, they live in the upstairs bedrooms. But um, we use House on the Hill as a place to meet um, speakers who come occasionally to give talks at Augustana. We'll round up some of our history majors and meet the speaker over um, a catered lunch. Now this man that you're looking at here, you probably don't recognize, but I bet uh, if I, when I tell you his name, you'll know who he is. Um, you know an old Credence Clearwater song called The Fortunate Son? It's one of the most famous uh, anti-war protest songs of the 1960s. You know that song? Dan Fogarty wrote the lyrics, I Ain't No Fortunate Son, he sings in this song. He wrote this song right after he was drafted to go to Vietnam and was angry about it. Well, you're looking at the fortunate son there at the end of the table. That's David Eisenhower, the grandson of President Eisenhower. When David was a kid, um, the presidential retreat outside of Washington, D.C. was opened, and David loved it there so much that they named it after him. It's called Camp David. So he is one of the most fortunate sons in American history, a son to a president, and then later he married one of Nixon's daughters, so he was a son-in-law to another president, Richard Nixon. And he was on campus once to give a talk, and we brought some of our history majors to meet with him. The conversation was wide ranging that afternoon. And as we put aside our dessert plates, uh, the talk turned to the Vietnam War. And David had some thoughts about that. He is today a professor of political science at uh, Penn, University of Pennsylvania, one of the Ivy League schools. He told us that he thought that if the United States had played its cards differently, that the US could have won the war in Vietnam. Now, one of the young women at the table, this one, raised her hand at that point. This is Caroline Skaggs. She was just a freshman. She was taking a course I was teaching called um, Rethinking the American Past, World War II to Present. And we had finished a, v a unit on Vietnam recently. So she raised her hand and she said, Mr. Eisenhower, um, I kind of get what you're saying, that the United States could have militarily defeated the North Vietnamese, but I just want to know what would have happened the day after the war ended. Uh, Dr. Eisenhower said, pardon me, what, what do you mean the day after the war ended? And Caroline said, well, the military wins the war, what happens next? Is the United States gonna keep its army in Vietnam for the next thousand years? Because the Vietnamese people have been fighting outside aggressors for their entire history, going back 2,500 years. They never stop fighting the Chinese, fighting the Japanese, fighting the French, fighting the, uh, 
what would happen the day after you won the war? Well, that was a great question to ask. And uh, Dr. Eisenhower did what I do, what most speakers do when you get cornered by a question um, that you don't really have a good answer to. He changed the subject. And later that day when I was driving Dr. Eisenhower back to the airport, he complimented me on our students at Augustana. He said, Lendl, you're, you're, the students that I've met here are really impressive. I, the students that were there with us at lunch were as good as any students I've ever seen at Penn. And that young woman with the blonde hair, she really, <laughs> she really pinned me to the wall with that question of hers. I just, uh, she's right. <laughs> Well, that was a real thrill when I was able to go back to Caroline and tell her what Dr. Eisenhower had said about um, his experience at lunch with our students. It made her day. I just was, spoke to Caroline um, three days ago on, on social media, on Facebook. Today, she lives in San Francisco. She's one of our distinguished alumni. I think she's uh, after graduation from Augustana. She went into data analysis with an economic consulting group and uh, rose through the bureaucracy and today chairs their entire team on the West Coast. Where did she learn to think like that? Well, she learned it, she would say, at Augustana in the study of history. We've had a lot of distinguished alumni who've gone on to make their marks. But uh, of course, we like to think that all of our alumni are distinguished in doing and doing good things. Let me tell you what our history alumni are doing to give you a sense of the possible, and help you imagine yourself into the future 10 years from now. And when you ask people what can history grads do, uh, or actually when parents come to me and ask me, my kid wants to major in history, what can a history grad do? Most of the time, what they have in mind is something like this. Do you guys know this TV program on NBC called Timeless? It was a, a time machine show. Uh, I think the setup was scientists had invented a time machine. And it, as soon as it was invented, um, you know what happens. A terrorist steals the thing and goes jetting off into the past for some unknown reason. Well, the U.S. government, Homeland Security, gets involved. They have to go find these terrorists and see what they're up to. So they form a team, and the team will use this uh, beta version of the time machine that's, that's not as good as the one that the terrorists took. And the director of Homeland Security says, how many seats can it hold? And the scientists say, there's three seats in this backup time machine. And the director of Homeland Security says, well, okay, first seat's got to go to a one of the scientists who made the thing, it's obvious, and then we need somebody from the military, so they draft the Navy SEAL to take the second seat. And then the Director of Homeland Security is thinking real hard, he goes, Who's gonna, who should we put in the third seat? And he goes, I've got it, a historian. So, uh, you see the historian here in the middle, and yes, um, all historians at Augustana College are just as good looking as she is, um, we pride ourselves on that. So what does this historian do? The military guy is there to kill people, if need be, and the scientist is there to fix the machine. What's the historian do? Now, this is where the show kind of falls apart. The only thing she does is tell them what kind of clothes people wear in the period to which they go. So, you know, if it's if it's the year JFK died, she gets them outfitted in the proper clothing. If, they, if, it's, if it's 1934 and Hitler's on the rise in Germany, she gives them little German expressions to say so that they fit in in crowds. In other words, she's full of trivia. That's what she does. I don't know why they even put her on that time machine. It seems to me like they could have just put, you know, Wikipedia on there and that would have been worked just, just fine for the purpose. But that's what most people think a history major is good for, so you know a lot of trivia. Au contraire, I say. This is what our history grads actually do when they graduate and go off into the world. 
we train our grads to work skillfully with information, and that is a valued commodity in what we call the information age. They learn to tackle difficult problems, difficult fuzzy problems involving human beings, because those are the kind of problems we solve when we're trying to make sense of the past. That's very different from math problems, you know, where two plus two equals four, or, or philosophy problems where everything is logical. In history, um, the problems are fuzzy and difficult, and at the end of the day, we have to have a lot of humility because they're hard to solve. But real life world problems are like that too. And our, our majors know how to, how to get in the mix with hard problems and not panic. You have to know that your knowledge ends somewhere. That's right, we teach our majors that. Now they learn to construct sensible accounts of things that they've made sense of and they communicate them well. Uh, history is one of the liberal arts and that's all it means to to be in the liberal arts is to learn the skill of communication and thinking. And then finally, um, most of our, well, all of our majors come here already loving history and we try to blow on that ember and turn that love into a raging fire. Is that right, Clarice? Is that what you said? <laughs> all of us, all of my friends in the history department, all of us just like sit and talk about history. It's just, it's so fun. We love it. I mean, like, I was out with my best friend. She's a major. We were just out getting coffee, and we just sat and talked about history. Well, that's what historians or history majors really do. Now let's make it practical. This is a chart showing uh, national data on where history majors go after graduation. Um, the chart's got two sides of the circle. The left side is a bunch of majors, and today we're looking at history with the orange streaks. The right side are careers. So the first thing you notice is history majors go in a lot of directions. This is data as measured 10 years past graduation. Um, let's follow the thickest orange swatches to see where the most majors go. And that would be this swatch right here. And that's into the law, it says. History is actually the best major for preparation for law school because the standard for the creation of knowledge is exactly the same in the law as it is in history. We learn to weigh evidence and interrogate witnesses and to assess information and then to make cases in front of public audiences, just like lawyers do. So no surprise there, that's the biggest place. But notice all the other places history majors go. Banking and finance is a big one. K through 12 education is a big one. Health and medicine, surprisingly, is right almost equal to K through 12 education. We're always looking for history majors who wanna to go to med school because it's easier to get into med school today with a history degree than it is with a pre-med or biology degree. The med schools are actively looking and reserving spots in their freshman classes for people who majored in the humanities. It makes you a better doctor, they think. That's not me talking, that's medical school stuff. And so that's one reason why you see, surprisingly, history majors going into health and medicine. Other majors here, or careers, are engineering, technology, sales, government. I can't read the small writing here. Oh, social and religious services. That's nation, national data. Let me show you some local Augustana data to help you visualize where you might go with a history degree. Well, I uh, spoke too soon. This is a page where we have photographs of Fortune 500 CEOs who majored in history. What if I told you that the single most common major among Fortune 500 CEOs was history? Would you believe that? Clarissa, you're, you're saying no, and, and you're right. It's not. It's not history. So I hope you didn't believe that just because I said it. That's another thing you learn in history is to not believe stuff that authorities say just because they say it. But history is number two. <laughs> uh, Fortune 500 CEOs are surveyed every year, and one of the questions is, what did you major in college? History is reliably number two, sometimes number three. Why is that? 
And I'll tell you why, with the story about this guy in the top right-hand corner, James Kiltz. He majored in history at a college uh, not very far away from Augustana, Knox College. And then he went off to a career. I floated his resume. I uh, got hired by Procter & Gamble. This was in the late 1970s, early 80s. His first account was Kool-Aid. Kool-Aid sales had plateaued. It was a dying brand. So Kiltz was assigned this account and told to do something about it. He formed his, he organized his team. People had been working with Kool-Aid for some years. He walks into the room and he begins asking them questions. He says, who drinks Kool-Aid? And the team sort of looked at each other like he was stupid or something. And one of them says, well, kids do. Kilt said, how do you know kids are drinking it and not somebody else? And they said, well, everybody knows this. And Kilt said, have we ever done a product survey to really find data on this? And they hadn't. So that's the first thing he did in charge of the Kool-Aid account was organize a survey and come to find out almost 70% of Kool-Aid then was being drunk by adults. That's how Country Time Lemonade was invented. It was Kool-Aid for adults. And with Country Time Lemonade, Kilts rescued Procter & Gamble's failing Kool-Aid brand. Now he said, he told an interview in the Wall Street Journal, I learned this method of approach from being a history major. History majors learn how to tackle difficult problems. We learn what we call heuristics to help us make sense of the past. And they translate directly into the corporate world or anywhere else. And Kiltz was just being a history major in the way he went about his business there with, with Kool-Aid. So turning from national data to Augustana data, where do our history majors go? Broadly speaking, they go in three uh, areas. Education is one, a government, Corporate government and not-for-profits is another, and then the professions like law school would be the third. We can drill down deeper though. More specifically, in the last seven years, uh, recent grads from Augustana have ended up in these careers. Consulting, banking and finance, teaching, the law, public services, information technology, filmmaking and instructional technology. Now, as soon as you come and major in history at Augustana, we are going to, oh, I'm missing the slide, there it is. We are gonna introduce you to what we call our compass points. It, it can be hard to sort of know what courses to take to match to what kind of things you think you might be doing after college. So we created the compass points program to help with this. We have. Five compass points. I know there's only four cardinal points on the compass, but <laughs> we had to have five compass points to be able to match our history major. The first one is called history communication. Uh, history communication prepares students to understand how people out in the world deal with the past. And so this compass point program will prepare you for a career in public history and in museums in archives, in library science, historic preservation, filmmaking, and the like. And here you see two of our recent grads who have gone in this direction. The second compass point is social justice. Um, if you're interested in social justice, then you'll take courses at Augustana in the major that give you a historical lens, shedding light on current inequalities in society, uh, as well as understanding how individuals and groups produce social change. So if you're interested in human rights work, in the law, in social services or religious work, social justice compass point might be you. Madison Wins from 2014 today specializes in immigration law and workman's compensation. As a lawyer, I just, I just spoke with Madison about two weeks ago on on an email. And then Mike Rogers is working at Augustana in the Office of Student Inclusion and Diversity, um, helping make a college education at Augustana equitable for all students. A third compass point that we offer is called Nations and Global Politics. Here you would uh, take courses focusing on the complex interactions between people 
in systems between local concerns and global movements. So if you're interested as an international business or public relations and things like peace studies, this is a compass point that would attract your attention. Caroline Salih, who I mentioned earlier, has gone down this road. And more recently, Joe Carroll in 17 graduated and went right into politics as a, um, a field consultant for Americans for Prosperity, a, a conservative um, political action group. There's history education. About a third of our majors become teachers. So this is the biggest compass point probably. Um, I think everybody can sort of visualize what it's like to be a, a high school history teacher. And the final compass point is information analytics. Here, um, this is uh, for people who want to, or who like, don't exactly know what they want to do after graduation and whose plan is to float their resume in the corporate or nonprofit world and see what happens. Um, this leads to careers in almost every conceivable direction. Uh, Gina here became a loan officer at First Federal Savings Bank, and Emily uh, works at John Deere locally in instructional technology. Who knows where you're going to go uh, if information analytics is uh, what your primary interest is in. So that's the history major. Now, let me introduce you to our faculty. There's six of us. Um, my specialty is American history uh, since the Civil War and also in the teaching and learning of history. We have another Americanist in Jane Simonson who does American women and gender history. Brian Leach is an environmental historian who just published a book called Butte, the town that ate itself about a big open pit mine in Butte, Montana. Uh, Lauren Hammond is our Latin Americanist and has been with us for three years. And Elizabeth Lawrence is brand new to Augustana teaching Asian history. You forgot about one. Who is that? Who would I be upset if you forgot about? Oh, Dr. Ellis. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> he teaches Europe and we Americanists, you know, we like, what a, who cares about Europe? No, I'm just I'm a European specialist. I'm just so you. If you want to say something. I'm glad you pointed that out. I knew I was missing somebody, but I couldn't, yeah. I couldn't think of who it was. And since I'm practically blind, I, I can't read my slides. Dr. Ellis is fantastic. Yes, he is fantastic. Well, what are courses like? Uh, on that note, Clarice, tell them about what it's like to be in one of Dr. Elvis' courses, where you do a symphony. Oh, they're so fun. Uh, <laughs> um, it's just the best time ever. So what he likes to do in some of his courses, not all of them, so no guarantees this will happen. Um, he likes to do this thing called reacting to the past, where you basically act as a character in whatever like whatever fits best with your class period. So I've been in Henry VIII's Reformation Parliament, and I've also been in um, the French Revolution um, General Assembly. So I I was a priest in one of them, or no, I was a bishop. I was a bishop in one of them, and the other one I was a financial person. And it was so cool because you're reading the the primary sources, but you're also trying to pass legislation and you're trying to do all these other things that were so fun so it's it lasts really how long it lasts like two weeks but it's the whole class period it's really kind of stressful sometimes because sometimes your character gets killed sometimes people try to kill you um it's it's really intense but it's also really cool because it's just a very different way of learning history uh dr ellis also does debates in his classes which are really cool um there are other professors though other than Dr. Ellis uh that do different things Dr. Leach you just make fun of him the whole time and that's just a great time <laughs> Dr. Calder has a lot of fun different things that he pulls in like I'm in a class right now about the 1960s and when we were still at school every day he would start out with a different song that would fit with our lesson so that was kind of fun um so I those are the three that I've had I had one that actually left so I can't tell you really about the other ones, but I know that personality-wise, they're great since I work with them. 
So they're really fun to be around. And I know that a lot of people really, really like them. Like I've heard so many good things about Dr. Lawrence and she's only been here for like a semester. So it's, it's crazy how well she's fit in already. Uh, courses come in various kinds. You began with 100 level courses mm -hmm. to introduce you to the heuristics of historical thinking. And um, then when you proceed to the gateway course to the major, History 200, all majors take it as soon as that, that they can, usually at the beginning of the sophomore year. History 200 introduces you. 300. It, right. It's 300. It changed. <laughs> Uh, History 300 introduces you to the research process of historians. Then you have your upper level courses, the 300 level courses. Your senior year, you'll take a seminar that produces a substantial work of historical knowledge. That's called the Senior Inquiry course. Uh, um, by the way, if you're a history education major, you will not take that. No matter how much you want to, no matter how hard you try, you're not taking it. <laughs> yeah, history education has its own track, really, and, and that doesn't end with a senior inquiry course. It ends somewhere else. Um, I just finished uh, teaching the seminar last year, or last fall, and uh, the seminar has about 12 students. They're going to produce a research paper about 30 to 50 pages long. It would be the most ambitious and demanding thing you've ever done in your life at this point. Um, on a topic that you probably discovered and got interested in, fell in love with earlier in your history. Some of these senior inquiry projects get published um, history um, scholarly journals later. Um, so we take that very seriously. I think like three of our last ones got published. It's like two or three of them got published. So that was fantastic. Your image oh, of wow, you look really young in those. Do I? It's not that long ago. <laughs> <laughs> That's just like four years ago, Clarice. <laughs> Maybe it's the haircut. We're all getting shaggy. Haircut. We're all getting shaggy under quarantine. Uh, <laughs> If your image of a college level history course is a professor at a lectern lecturing um, for 50 minutes, um, that's not how it's done here. Um, that's how history was taught to me as an undergraduate. Professors covered as much information as they could. You took as many notes as you could and then you spat it back at midterm and at final exam time and perhaps you wrote a paper. Yeah, it's not like that here. Um, we follow an approach to history called uncoverage. The problem with covering so much material and is essentially cover up for students makes history history. Those mental thinking habits that historians use to create knowledge. We want to teach you that. We don't really care all that much whether you can um, ace a midterm exam because you got the answers right, you're going to forget all that stuff in two weeks later. We want you, five years after graduation, to have a brain that's imprinted with historical thinking. And so that's what we seek to uncover in our courses. For example, let me get, just give you an example of what this looks like. Uh, until last year, if you Googled Adolf Hitler, in a Google search, the first thing that would come up was this, the Hitler Historical Museum. It, Dr. Ellis had noticed uh, some years ago that a lot of students were using the Hitler Historical Museum in research papers on Adolf Hitler. Well, something we want to uncover for students is how to assess the quality of information you're working with. The Hitler Historical Museum looks like good source of information. I mean, if you read the print here, it's, it all sounds good. But how, how do you know where this is coming from? Something that historians do that people in other disciplines don't do it, uh, nearly as much is we're kind of we're always uh, careful about the sources of the information that we use. We call the thinking skills we apply in this direction sourcing. So how would you source the Hitler Historical Museum? Most students tell me, well, I would just keep reading down the page. I'd scroll down looking to see if I see any problems. And if it sounds good, then I would, I would use it. That's called vertical reading. 
and it's the worst way to source web-based information. So what we want to uncover for students is something called lateral reading, where you get off the Histor Hitler Historical Museum and go try to find out who this museum is. And if you do that, we would teach you to use a tool like whois.net. That's a domain registry. We look up the Adolf Hitler Museum on whois.net. We could see their address there. It's in San Francisco. Well, it, one click more, we can go to Google Earth and look up this museum. You want to see it? See the address there? 527 Third Street. Here's 527 Third Street on Google Earth. It's an apartment building next to a bodega. The Hitler Historical Museum is some group of fascists who are trying to keep Hitler's memory alive for the 21st century and to snare unsuspecting college students <laughs> doing research um, by making their website look good on the first couple of pages and then they draw you in. That's what it is. So that's an example of the kind of thinking skills we try to teach in the history major. We call that sourcing and it's the central methodological problem in history uh, as it is in law. How do you trust somebody? How do you, how do you, what kind of questions do you need to ask them to, to know what sort of testimony they're capable of giving? And in a world of information and fake news, this becomes something that all human beings need and, and citizens need uh, if they're not going to be continually bamboozled. All right, what about history off campus, Clarice? What do we need to say about this? Let's see, I'm looking at the chat in here. Uh, Cooper, if you want to teach history, how beneficial is it to major in history along with education? That's the way it's done. There's, you don't have any choice in that. Um, and the state of Illinois requires um, people who want to go into social studies to be double majors, essentially education plus either history or one of the other social sciences. You can choose to just major in history and then go work at a private school that doesn't you know, live by the state requirements or major in history and then go get a master's degree of education. You can do that which strings out the process, but everybody who wants to be a high school teacher at August Senate will be double major. Um, classes wise, those are a little bit, those are just kind of planned for you. You have a program that is given to you, so you have to take certain types of classes, so you're well versed in different time periods and different geographical regions so that you're able to teach all kinds of classes so you're ready to teach all of them. So even though I say I'm a European specialist, which I am, I'll be able to teach AP Euro, I'll be able to teach any 